Britain's cathedrals, majestic, magnificent, monumental. For more than 1,400 years, they've dominated Britain's landscape. Never out of sight, never out of mind. Epic structures, they represent our history and the changing fortunes of a nation. I'm Tony Robinson, and in this series, I'll be exploring six of Britain's greatest cathedrals. What a privilege. Their stories of rivalry and royalty. Henry was determined to strip the church of its power, of struggles and sacrifice. Who will rid me of this troublesome priest? Of martyrs and murder. And then they just hacked him down right on the spot. Containing more than a thousand years of history, I'll discover how these buildings were constructed. Isn't that extraordinary? how they've evolved, and what secrets they hold. York Minster Cathedral. Started in 1220, it took thousands of men over 200 years to build this masterpiece of design. 22 storeys high, over 500 feet long, its high towers and long nave are home to a staggering 60% of all England's medieval glass. When it was completed in 1472, more than two million individual pieces made up its 128 windows. York's a city that puts its past on show. Evidence of 2,000 years of history is all around you. The long straight Roman roads, the defensive wall that still runs through the city, and of course, at its heart, this magnificent building, York Minster. First things first, why is it called a minster and not a cathedral? Well, actually, it isn't. Its real name is the Metropolitical Cathedral and Church of St Peter in York. A minster was simply the name given to anywhere in Anglo-Saxon times that had started off as a missionary teaching church. A lot of other cathedrals started off as minsters, it's just that in York the name stuck, and I don't think they're going to change it anytime soon. York Minster might have a distinctive name, but its structure follows a familiar cathedral pattern. Shaped like a cross, it runs east to west, has a main tower above its nave and small chapels built around it. It was the vision of one bishop who wanted a cathedral to rival the splendour of Canterbury. His name was Walter de Grey and he became Archbishop here in the year 1215. It was under him the construction of the current minster got underway, building on the site of a previous Anglo-Saxon cathedral. Work began in the year 1220 with this bit here, the south transept. It was Grey's energy and vision that made York the second biggest Gothic cathedral in the whole of Europe. As construction of the cathedral gathered pace, it was necessary to create a boundary round it. The land inside this boundary was given a special name, the Liberty of York. In medieval times, this land was ruled by the Archbishop of York and governed by church law and not the king's law. It was almost like the Archbishop's own private kingdom. The king's men weren't even allowed into the Liberty unless the Archbishop gave them permission. I bet you know the phrase, taking the Liberty, but you probably didn't know that it originated right here in York. In the 13th century, the Lord Mayor of York used to enter the liberty of the cathedral, which is marked right here nowadays by this gatepost, and he did so so often, and it was so unpopular that it eventually spawned the phrase that we all know today. The laws within the Liberty were known for being very lenient on the clergymen who lived within its boundaries, and some of the vicars and monks took advantage of this. In the 13th century, 
The local vicars used to hang out in the taverns near the monastery and they would drink too much and they'd kick off and this became a big issue with the townspeople. But the vicars didn't care. They knew they couldn't get caught because they could scoot across the street straight into the monastery. There are even reports of drunk vicars lying flat on their backs on this very grass, laughing hysterically at all the mischief and mayhem they'd caused. Misbehaving monks and trespassing Lord Mayors might explain why in 1285, York Minster established the world's very first police force to maintain order within its grounds. Today, this police force still exists, with eight constables responsible for the Minster and the safety of the 600,000 tourists that visit here every year. Are you guys actually real coppers? We are, yes, Tony, we're real coppers with the full powers of arrest within the precinct in the Minster. So what sort of things do you have to deal with? All sorts. Uh, the Minster's in the heart of York. We have a lot of the problems that any inner city police force would deal with. We've had break and entry. We've had someone rescued off the tower top by helicopter, which the police officer was involved in. What about things like terrorism? Do you come across that? Well, thankfully, we haven't had any incidents in York yet. But if we have a look down here, we, you can see our newly installed anti-vehicle stones. Stupidly, I'd thought, oh, well, these must be some representation of, of something medieval. Today's police mainly look after the Minster's thousands of tourists. But for its first 200 years, the cathedral's police force was responsible for the country's biggest building site and the thousands of workers it employed who lived within the grounds. They deal with everything from murder to the medieval crime of fornication. In 1472, when the Minster was finally complete, this hive of activity that had surrounded it for two decades slowly expanded and sowed the seeds for the city we know today. The cathedral became the focal point of the town and has remained so ever since. For anyone who lives here, it's impossible to imagine the place without it. Which is why, in the 1960s, the locals got such a shock when they discovered their beloved cathedral was about to collapse. The Cathedral of York is one of the finest examples of Gothic architecture in the world. But it's not the first cathedral to occupy this spot. An Anglo-Saxon one had been built on the same site in 627 AD. When the minster we see today was built, the foundations of this earlier cathedral were never removed. And in the 1960s, this oversight nearly proved disastrous. In 1967, a story hit the headlines. York Minster, the biggest Gothic building in the country, is on the move. Experts had surveyed the massive 60-metre central tower and were predicting York Minster in danger of collapse. Gothic magnificence could become a shambles of tumbled stone. The tower of the cathedral, weighing over 25,000 tons, was slowly sinking into the ground. The engineers employed by the cathedral to save the building had to think of a way to stop it from sinking further. So imagine, this is the tower, right, and this is the adjacent wall. So if the tower continues to sink, then this wall will begin to crack and then it'll collapse in on itself. So in order to prevent that happening, they dug deep down into the base of the tower and inserted these. Lots and lots of massive steel rods in order to prevent the tower from sinking any further. With the engineers digging down into the foundations of the cathedral, it presented a chance for the country's top archaeologists to have a look at the history they knew from medieval transcripts existed under it. The archaeologists reckoned they'd got a golden opportunity. 
They thought that underneath the cathedral there would be layer upon layer upon layer of history which the engineering work would reveal. But from the engineers' point of view, they'd got a potentially collapsing cathedral. The last thing they wanted was to stop their work while the archaeologists poked about. The solution was simple. The engineers would work as normal during the day, and once they left in the evening, the archaeologists would move in, working through the night to preserve as many artefacts as possible. The archaeologists began to find a treasure trove of pieces, but they just didn't have time to examine every single bit. Anything that looked remotely interesting was boxed up and sealed with just a short note from the archaeologists guessing at what they thought they'd found. Believe it or not, these boxes have remained sealed for over 50 years. It's quite remarkable, and I've been granted special access to the cathedral's archives to take a look at some of them. So this has not been examined since the 60s? No. Well, this is exciting. Look, it says Roman and medieval YM bronzes. What was YM? Yorkminster. Uh, you, Yorkminster, oh, <laughs> yeah. duh, yes. So, let's see what we've got. Oh, look at these wonderful little packets. Yeah, so the archaeologists really were under pressure. Yeah. And they were trying to get as many boxes and different things, so we find some really interesting packaging as we're unlocking as well, a little time capsule. Oh, look at this one. Oh, I remember those. They might be worth having a look through. OK. I've been very scrupulously looking at that, and I can't find anything in there. <laughs> See if you as... can. I think this one might just be kitchen towel. <laughs> what a brilliant anticlimax <laughs> in here. There is nothing. The absence of evidence only proves that there's nothing in here. Underwhelmed but undeterred, we keep on looking. Get the label out to see what this says. It just says it was found in the nave in the central area. It's hard to know whether it's, it's something from a costume or something from an industrial type process. Or, uh, that's so intriguing. Oh, this is interesting. In brown soil with small rubble, down to level of bottom of Saxon graves. Oh, gorgeous! Big Saxon pin. Oh, this is proper archaeology, yeah, isn't it? absolutely. And no one has looked at no this one's looked at them. for 50 years or so. I feel so lucky to be the first person to look at these. The Saxon pin and chain found beneath the cathedral tell us that the people that lived there before it was built must have been skilled at making bronze materials. How many artefacts do you reckon you might have that you still need to look at closely? We talk about archaeology in terms of boxes, and I know that I have 650 boxes. 650 boxes? Yes. The artefacts found underneath the cathedral must have sat in the same spot for over 800 years as work began on the Minster in 1220. When that work began, it was an important period of change in English architecture. Masons had begun to experiment and carve elaborate pieces of stonework in a style we now refer to as Gothic architecture. This cathedral has got some of the finest masonry work in the world, combining two architectural styles, Gothic and Norman. It's also got some of the finest examples of these. Now, you might think these are gargoyles, and they do look very similar, but they're not. Gargoyles are the ones with water spouts, which are used as drains. Those are grotesques. Just like gargoyles, grotesques are decorative carvings designed to ward off evil. And to take a closer look at them, I need to travel 12 storeys to the top. Luckily, I'm taking the lift. Given how dizzyingly high we are up here, it surprises me that the medieval masons bothered to do such an elaborate amount of detail. Well, God can see it, and the medieval philosophy was it was done for the glory of God. 
What were these all supposed to be? Mythical beasts and scary objects, and, and sometimes they were um, taking the mick out of people in authority in the church. There's not much of them left, is there? We're seeing hundreds of years of uh, erosion and corrosion here, so there's an echo of, of what was originally there. And it's for the, the carvers to join the dots together and to interpret that. What causes this erosion? Well, um, centuries of corrosion during the Industrial Revolution and, of course, the sheer battering we get up here. So the wind literally carving the stone out. As you can see here, the magnesium limestone is turning back to sand. Oh, yeah, look, it's really... just comes right away in your hands, doesn't it? Look at that. That is scary. But that one is brand new, isn't it? Yeah, so this is the same magnesium limestone that we've just crumbled from yeah. the same quarry. A team of stonemasons working at the cathedral have identified a grotesque in the worst state of repair and set about making a brand new replacement based on their interpretation of the original. I love this person here. She's even got a baby. Who would that have been? Well, these are the wives of King Solomon. These grotesques are based on the story, so you have the two wives. So that's one wife. Yep. And round here... The second wife. We've got the second wife, yeah. Oh, she's good, isn't she? And presumably that's the man himself. The detail is fantastic. That mouth. And of course, once the uh, scaffold is down, no one will see that again. That's Hundreds of years. The grotesques at York Minster were renowned throughout the country and would draw people from all over England to see them. But in 1328, the cathedral found itself attracting visitors from all over Europe for a different reason. A royal wedding of the English King Edward III to a French lady-in-waiting, Philippa of Hainaut. Normally, the service would have been conducted in Westminster, but the post of Archbishop of Canterbury was vacant, so they asked the Archbishop of York to do it instead. Trouble was, the church still hadn't been built, there was no roof on the nave, and during the course of the ceremony, there was a snowstorm. Still, the wedding went ahead. Like royal relationships today, theirs was described as the love affair of the decade. The couple were together for 41 years, producing 13 children, eight of them sons. Edward and Philippa had enough sons to start a war, literally. From them are descended all the main players in one of England's most influential conflicts, one that would shape Britain and the church forever, the War of the Roses. The descendants broke off into the Yorkist and Lancastrian lines, with Lancaster represented by a red rose and York a white. The ultimate winner, Henry VII, came from the Lancastrian line and united the two warring houses by marrying Elizabeth of York and went on to produce perhaps England's most notorious king, Henry VIII. This stunning rose window high in the gable of the south transept commemorates the unification of the houses of York and Lancaster. It was commissioned by the couple's son, Henry VIII, in the year 1515. And it's a really confident piece of work, isn't it? It seems to be saying the fighting of the Wars of the Roses is now completely over. Welcome to the new unified world of the Tudors. One of the most famous stained glass windows in Britain, it remained in place for more than 400 years. But then, in 1984, came a ferocious blaze, causing cracks in 40,000 pieces and threatening to destroy the entire cathedral. Looking at York Minster Cathedral today, it's hard to imagine that just over 30 years ago the whole building was almost destroyed when one of its greatest achievements 
became a weakness. The Masons building the cathedral in the 13th century pushed the boundaries in what could be achieved in stonework to the very limit, allowing them to create this magnificent nave. At 99 feet, this is the widest nave of any cathedral in England. In fact, it's wider than it's tall. And its fabulous roof alone took 60 years to complete. But not all is as it seems. Look at that beautiful ceiling. Now look down here. This is really good because you can see it much closer. And the thing is, that ceiling isn't really stone. The Masons knew the walls of the nave could never support such a heavy roof, so instead they made it of wood and painted it to look like stone, allowing it to soar higher and stretch wider than any other nave in England. But the wooden roof would cost them dearly over 700 years later. One hot summer night in 1984, lightning struck the roof just up there. It caused a massive fire, which posed the biggest threat to the cathedral's history in 800 years. The flames tore through the building and spread towards the main tower. If they reached it, they'd funnel upwards, then mixing with the oxygen inside, they'd create the biggest chimney fire Britain had ever seen and bring down the entire structure. The fire needed to be stopped. But that required a quick and radical decision. The firefighters realised that the roof couldn't be saved, so they used its weight to bring the blaze under control. They aimed their hoses at the burnt and weakened roof supports, forcing them to collapse like a row of dominoes. Then, like a massive fire blanket, the roof suffocated the fire below. The fire caused two and a quarter million pounds worth of damage. The south transept was under six feet of muddy water which seeped into the foundations. The vaulted ceiling and the roof of the south transept were destroyed. There was bad damage to the rose window. And by the time the fire had been put out, that stained glass window had broken into 40,000 pieces. Amazingly, the lead running through the window held the cracked glass together, meaning it could be fully repaired. As impressive as the rose window is, it's by no means the cathedral's most famous window. York Minster contains the finest collection of medieval stained glass in the world. And its most stunning example is this, the Great East Window. It's the largest expanse of medieval glass in the country and one of the most spectacular artistic achievements of the Middle Ages, depicting scenes from the Bible's Old Testament. This masterpiece of glazing can all be attributed to the workshop of one master glazier. His name was John Thornton. It is quite incredible, isn't it? 23 metres high by 9 metres wide. That's bigger than a tennis court. Originally from Coventry, Thornton was commissioned to build the window in 1405, 185 years after the cathedral's construction started. In his contract, it says that Thornton will glaze the window over a three-year period and in return will receive £46. And then there's another clause below which says that if he completes the window before the deadline, he'll get an additional £10 bonus. So there's an incentive. Thornton's original contract is still part of the cathedral's archive to this day, and he more than fulfilled its obligations. Despite the window's intricacy, Thornton did deliver it early, and so was able to collect his £56 in full. 
That's almost £375,000 in today's money. These windows would have had a massive impact on the congregation. They were storytelling devices. And given that virtually nobody could read, let alone afford a book, that meant that these windows were virtually the only way that people could get to know the stories from the Old Testament. Each window told stories about the creation of the world and the predicted apocalypse at its end. In 2008, the hundreds of stained glass panels were removed from the 15th century window so the York glaziers could begin restoring the fragile masterpiece and, just as importantly, give them a good clean. How many bits of glass do you reckon are up there in that window? Many thousands. We haven't counted them. We've been too busy cleaning them, but a lot, certainly. And what is that process? How do you start? We take the advantage of having the glass in, in the studio to do a very thorough clean, not just because the window will look you know, more attractive clean, but because the dirt itself can be a threat to the stability of the glass. The dirt can be very moisture retentive, and moisture is the great enemy of medieval stained glass. You called it dirt just then. Yes. What exactly is it? It's a horrible mixture, really. It, there's soot, and then, of course, there's un unpleasant um, accretions, including human skin from the many hundreds of thousands of people who come into the building and generate their own little sort of fog of, of dirt as they go. To restore and clean each window will take an estimated 50 years, at which point the first pieces will need cleaning all over again. So the task is never ending. But York's lucky that any of its windows have remained intact. A century ago, it came under attack from a form of warfare its people had never before witnessed. German Zeppelins had been bombing British ports since the start of World War I. Now these flying fortresses were coming inland. They were more than 500 feet in length, longer than a football pitch, and carried 1,600 kilograms of explosives, multiple machine guns, and had a top speed of 10 miles per hour. On the night of May the 2nd, 1915, the city's watchman looked upwards. Silhouetted against the burning skyline was a distinctive cigar shape slowly moving towards the Minster. As one hovered over York, it dropped 18 bombs. Nine people were killed, another 40 injured, and countless homes were destroyed, all in the space of 10 minutes. The next day's papers reported the tragedy. This is just one of the accounts. William Chapelow and his wife, Sarah, had been to the cinema. They were in St Saviour's Place when he was hit by a bomb. The lower parts of both his legs were blown off and his skull was fractured. Incredibly, the cathedral survived this attack unscathed. And although the Germans tried again, the Minster was spared the ravages of war. Its congregation, however, was not. Thousands of men from the city signed up to join the fighting. But one in ten of them never came home. The city wanted a permanent tribute to the fallen, and so an ambitious project began. The King's Book of Heroes. It's thought to be one of the largest and heaviest books in the world, weighing in at over nine stone. It's still kept here at York, and I've been allowed to take a look. So how did it come to be created? It was a community effort. Um, the people of York felt that the memorials in the city were not being created quick enough. This poignant memorial book contains photographs of all the young men who were killed in battle. Each is accompanied with their age and rank, details provided by their families 
and compiled with help from a local newspaper. One page is dedicated to George Edwin Ellison. Ellison left the army in 1912, but rejoined at the start of the war two years later. George had a wife, Hannah, and a one-year-old son named James when he was sent to France. On the 11th day of the 11th month, 1918, the German and British High Command were nearing a peace deal. George and his squadron were sent on patrol, and just minutes before the armistice was announced, George was shot. He was the last person to be killed in action in World War I. His grave in France faces that of John Parr, the first British soldier to fall. Are they all men? No, we have Betty Stevenson, who was killed in one of the raids. Betty worked as a driver for the YMCA, transporting injured soldiers to and from hospital and taking their families to visit them. She was killed on the 30th of May, 1918, during an aerial bombardment of Etape in France. She was just 21. When peace came, York looked for a way to commemorate women like Betty. The result was this. The Five Sisters stained glass window. It's the country's only memorial to the women of the British Empire who sacrificed their lives in the First World War. More than 1,400 such women. Honored on a medieval window, fully restored and re leaded in 1924. They've even got all their names written down here. Stewardesses, munitions, transport, nursing. Some names are famous, like Edith Cavell, the British nurse shot by a German firing squad in 1915 for helping 200 Allied soldiers escape from occupied Belgium. There are still services held at York to commemorate the war dead. These important services are the responsibility of Peter Moga, a clergyman with the grand title of Canon Precentor. So what does Precentor mean? Precentor means the one who sings first. You're the one who goes... And when it goes, oh, Lord, da, 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 da. And then the choir responds. Oh, so right. the first singer and then the choir is the second singer back. There is a great deal of theatricality in what you do, isn't there? There is indeed. You can't work in a space the size of York Minster without wanting to milk it, really, for its dramatic potential. I'm glad you said that, <laughs> not me. <laughs> and like every theatrical performance, costume is all important. When preparing for special services like that of Remembrance Sunday to honour those lost in war, the canons wear robes known as vestments. As you put it on then, you just went like that? I did. Um, there's a tradition there. This is the stole. <laughs> and there's a tradition, a lot of uh, stoles that are made with the mark of the cross here. This one actually hasn't but traditions die hard. So you gave us a little and kiss anyway. They kiss the cross when they put the stole on. So yeah. it's hardwired, I think, really. So the stole goes on here yeah. and is fixed into place. And then over this goes the, uh, the chasuble, which is really a sort of poncho-shaped garment. Cathedrals tend to be quite cold and you're actually adding a few layers. Yes, I mean, you can see how it developed. Vestments not just having a ceremonial use, but actually keeping people warm as well. The vestments worn by Peter today replace a set that was used in the cathedral for over 90 years, worn away in a rather unusual way. I've noticed that virtually all clergy who work in cathedrals uh, hold their hands like this, as you are now. Do, when you train, you see, you're taught to keep your hands like that so yeah. that they don't, they don't fiddle with anything. But, of course, then they do get against the fabric and they wear. And that's what happens that's to you exactly clothes. That's exactly what's happened there. Some of the robes kept at York have been used for hundreds of years and at some historic events.
One of the most important events in the cathedral's history came in 2015, when the cathedral was packed for the first consecration of a female bishop. A dramatic moment for the Church of England, but too much for some. Is it now your will that she should be ordained? York Minster has always stood apart from other English cathedrals. Only York and Canterbury Cathedral have archbishops who together lead the Church of England. This independence goes back to William the Conqueror, who chose two of his friends as archbishops of York and Canterbury, then refused to say which one was in charge of the other. This semi-detached status might help explain why the bishops here have often had a reputation for being quite outspoken. Like York's Bishop Cyril Garbutt, who became one of the first to expose the full extent of the Nazis' atrocities against the Jews. Writing in the York Evening Press in 1942, he accused them of pursuing a policy of deliberate extermination, calling it the greatest crime in history. His article would open the world's eyes and catapult him onto the international stage. In 1943, he went to Russia to try to bridge the emerging gulf between the two wartime allies, Russia and America. Then he went on to New York to talk to the New York Times about Russia's religious freedoms. His role as a statesman was widely applauded. In April 1944, it even earned him a place on the front cover of Time magazine. More outspoken bishops have followed. In 2005 came the appointment of John Sentamu. Born in Uganda, Sentamu had been imprisoned for speaking out against 1970s dictator Idi Amin. He later fled to Britain, joined the clergy, and became the first black bishop in the UK. In 2015, a decade after his own appointment, he helped strike another blow for equality. In January that year, the Church of England was ready to consecrate its first ever woman bishop, Libby Lane. This was an historic moment that finally elevated women to the same standing as men within the Church of England. It came at the end of a long and hard-fought battle. A battle that many senior women in the church once feared would never be won. There were moments when I despaired, um, because I thought if this change doesn't happen, whether for me or for others, then the Church of England will have lost such um, a gift yeah. uh, in terms of uh, uh, being a, a, a place that welcomed all sorts of folk. Yeah. The first woman bishop, Libby Lane, was actually consecrated right here. Yes, and it was a glorious moment. We're all so excited. And you know, the thing that amazed me most is I prepared for this moment for a very long time. And then it was to see Libby with stiletto heels walking up. And I would never dare, because I'd been bred in a generation where women didn't wear stilettos in the church. And also, I didn't dare on this floor because the, the floor is, is not even. And, and I thought it was the, the sheer courage to the do chutzpah, that. Yeah. The chutzpah, exactly. She was taking this role on. She was going to do, to do what she was going to do. She was going to be who she is. And I thought, that, that's what I've been looking for, to let free women to be who they are. But not everyone was happy with such progress. As the service got underway, there was a dramatic intervention. Is it now your will that she should be ordained? It is. With respect, Your Grace, I ask to speak on this absolute impediment, please. Bishop Sentamu chose to ignore the protest by Church of England vicar Paul Williamson, who believed that the Bible gave no authority for there to be women bishops. 
and Sentamu proceeded with the ceremony. Although the consecration of female bishops excites strong emotions among followers, the church's supreme governor is also a woman. Queen Elizabeth II. One of her earliest visits to the Minster came in 1961, as a guest at the wedding of her cousin, the Duke of Kent. She was accompanied by the Queen Mother, the Duke of Edinburgh, and a 12-year-old Prince Charles. In 2012, she returned to continue a ritual practiced by her predecessors for centuries. The Queen visited the city to hand out the so-called Maundy money, a tradition set by King John in 1213. Before then, the bishops, inspired by the Bible, would wash the feet of the poor every Maundy Thursday, which is the day before Good Friday. However, King John preferred to present the poor with silver coins instead. Today, the Queen sees it as an important part of her church duties. On the day in question, people are given two purses, a red one and a white one. In the red one, there's money in lieu of food and clothing, and in the white one are the Maundy coins. And you're given as many coins as the number of years that the sovereign's been alive. So you'd need a few more than that, wouldn't you? In 2012, the Queen handed out money to members of York Minster's congregation in recognition of their services to the church and their communities. Once again, confirming the ties between the people of York and its beloved Minster. It's funny, you know, but this town, unlike any other that I know in England, feels like an extension of its cathedral. There's nowhere that the minster ends and the town begins. And because you've got these big Roman roads up here, you can see the cathedral from the horizon. And then, as you get towards the city, it's revealed to you. Bang! Never out of sight never out of mind. And that, for me, is symbolic of the cathedral. It's always been an important institution, constantly bubbling away in the background of English life and occasionally boiling over, forcing its way onto the world stage and into the history books. Tony's back next Friday night at 8, and Alan Titchmarsh opens the doors of Winterfell from Game of Thrones in new Secrets of the National Trust Tuesday night at 8. But next, Channel 5's got your Friday night sorted with Jane MacDonald and friends. She'll be belting out hits with Elkie Brooks and Lee Mead after the news headlines.